Good morning and welcome to the Global Smaller Companies Trust PLC Outlook and Opportunities Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received in the meeting itself. However, the company can review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Christine Cantrell, Director, Head of Investment Trust. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Yes, I'm the Head of Investment Trust Sales, and uh, we're delighted to be here today. It's actually the first meeting that we've held on this platform since um, Peter Ewan's announced his retirement. So it's with um, a heavy heart that we'll um, host today and hear his, his words of wisdom and you may be aware that the uh, Nish Patel and Peter Hughes became joint lead managers uh, at the start of this year in January. And then at the end of April, uh, coinciding with the year end of the, the company, um, Nish will then become the lead uh, for, for lead manager. So um, we'll hear from both of them today, which is great. And obviously the main point of this is going through an update of the portfolio, but then hearing from you and um, getting your questions that both managers will be able to answer. And um, so um, obviously the only other thing I'll mention is that we have slides to go through and uh, there's obviously a risk um, slide that you should all look at. Um, as our compliance team alerted us. Um, but the other thing that we wanted to highlight is there's a fact sheet with all the updated performance uh, with different types of um, analysis. So please do have a look at that in the handouts section. So with that, I'll hand over first to Peter. Thanks very much, Christine, and um, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for thanks for joining us this morning. I'm very delighted to have got Nish with me today. Um, as Christine has said, Nish will become the lead manager with effect from the start of May, and obviously we're, we're joint lead managers for now and working as closely together as we always have done, really, as part of a team running this fund. Um, I'm not going to go on about the history and whatever about this fund in, in great detail, but just to provide a bit of context for what it is. Um, it really is what it says on the tin. Um, it is providing um, predominantly retail investors with a broad exposure to global smaller companies listed on the world's stock markets, aiming to achieve um, capital growth with a high, you know, a high total return over the long term. And we take a long term approach to our investments. Uh, we always have done that. And we run it on a team basis so that, yeah, obviously my departure is uh, just one person in a, in a large team of individuals managing this portfolio, managing this trust. Uh, we take a long-term approach to investing, and this we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, you know, we're looking for high-quality businesses, and we're looking to buy them at attractive valuations. So we do have a valid valuation discipline when we when we buy into stocks. We've delivered strong long-term uh, performance over so uh, in capital and income, and actually very proud of that 53 years of dividend growth um, that the fund has delivered over the years. Um, just looking on the right of this slide, you can see the benchmark. Uh, which is a blended benchmark of UK um, and small and uh, global smaller companies in the proportions 2080. Um, the UK weighting over the years has gone down in the benchmark and in our fund, but we, we currently actually will come on to talk about it, but we're currently quite positive about the UK market in the global context. Um, the fund has, you know, is a broadly diversified fund, so over 200 names uh, on, the, on the portfolio. Again, we're going to talk about what we've been doing on the portfolio and some of those names as we go through these, these slides. Um, gearing, we use a bit of gearing. Uh, the board are keen on uh, using the leverage uh, uh, capabilities of investment trust structure. So we have 5% gearing at the moment. And you can see a discount. This was at the end of January, is, is, uh, is, as stated there, quite elevated at the moment. The board, um, if you see the RNS is the board actively buy shares in on this uh, on this discount uh, most days of the week at the moment and um, taking an active approach over the long term in my in my tenure the fund was issuing shares at a premium it's now buying back shares at, at, at this discount and in the process enhancing NAV I'm gonna I'm gonna hand on now to Nish who's going to talk a little bit about uh, how we look at um, picking stocks well good morning everyone um, I'm delighted to be able to to, to talk to you um, as Peter said the investment philosophy of the Global Smaller Companies Trust is, is to take a long-term conservative approach to buying good quality growing businesses when they become available at an attractive valuation. Um, we are bottom-up stock pickers. 
when we look at a business, we're, we're very focused on the fundamentals. We're trying to assess the quality of the business model, um, the management team, the valuation, and where the risks are likely to come from. So what is a good quality business? What does that mean to us? Well, first of all, we have to be able to fully understand the business and have a good idea of what the business might look like in 10 years time, where the risks are likely to come from and how to value the business. So that automatically rules out large parts of our, invest our investable universe uh, where we just don't know what the business uh, will do in the future. Most of the businesses that we invest in have really strong competitive advantages. So they might be low cost producers of the product or they might offer a differentiated product or service. Most of the companies that we invest in tend to have good returns, um, better than uh, peer group margins um, and tend to consistently take market share from their competitors. We love businesses that generate lots of free cash flow because that is indicative of good accounting quality. And it also creates op op optionality for the management team to, to generate further growth. Um, we think pricing power is really important um, and that suggests that a company has a strong competitive position. Um, and we like uh, companies that are operating in industries that have high barriers to entry um, or that are consolidating. Um, we, live, we now live in a world where interest rates are above 5%. And so that means that companies that, that we invest in have to have strong um, balance sheets. Uh, so that is important at the moment. And something that is, is, is uh, specific to smaller companies is diversification. We don't want to be involved in companies that um, are too reliant on one particular customer or one particular product. Uh, and we try and avoid those types of situations. Um, when it comes to management teams, first and foremost, we have to be partnered with capable operators that deliver very few surprises on a day-to-day -day basis from, from their operations, um, that have a history of being good capital allocators, uh, that create lots of shareholder value from, from their capital investment decisions. And we love instances where um, we're, we're partnering alongside a management team that have significant skin in the game that, and that own a large chunk of, of, of the company's shares. So that's what we think is a good quality business and, and a good management team. We're trying to buy these businesses at attractive valuations, and that's not always easy to do because many of these businesses are very well recognized by the investment community and their multiples or their valuations are bid up significantly. But we're opportunistic. and We like to buy into these businesses when the valuation is attractive and, and suggests limited downside and attractive future upside. And we'll use a whole host of different metrics such as multiples, earnings, cash flows, book value, private market valuations. So if we're doing our job uh, well, then it will show up in the numbers. And you can see here that the average company um, in, in our portfolio versus the average company in the benchmark, um, the quality metrics really do come through here, where the average company in, in our portfolio will have a higher gross margin, higher operating margin, higher return on equity than the average company in the benchmark. And it, ha it has lower le levels of debt as well. On the valuation side, the multiple of 16.4 times for the average company in our, in our portfolio is lower than the benchmark multiple of just under 20 times. And we're offering a higher dividend yield as well. So the portfolio, the, the philosophy and process really does work over the long term. You can see here our performance over the last 25 years. Global smaller companies has um, appreciated almost 11 fold over the last 25 years. That's significantly higher than the smaller company indices, um, which have increased by between seven times and eight times over the same period. And it has significantly outpaced the FTSE 100, which has only doubled over the last 25 years. So if I, if I could just talk you through um, where we're positioned, we can start talking about um, you know, how we're positioned and, um, and what, we're, what we've been doing on the portfolio, which I'm sure some of you are interested to hear about. Um, this really shows the position at the end of January where we're positioned. So taking it from the left, you can see the geographic allocation 
the first thing to say about this really is that where a company is listed, you know, that, that's what defines where these, uh, where these weightings come from. And, you know, quite often it's, misle it's a misleading representation of the skew of the portfolio. So it says 25.1% of the UK, and that is 25.1% of the portfolio invested in UK listed companies. But a lot of those UK companies are, you know, very international in scope. So it's probably not as exposed to the UK economy if you're, if you're, if you're thinking and worried about that. But ultimately, those those are the weightings. It's it's ultimately an outcome of our stock selection process, which is looking for these high quality companies around the world. That's how we're weighted. In in the last period, the last uh, in the financial year to date, we're nine months through at this point. Um, the weighting in Japan has gone up a little bit. We put some more money into Japan, and and just very quickly on that, just to make you aware, um, we are now using following the the, the combination of what was the BMO uh, asset management business with Columbia Thread Needle. We are now able to make use of an internal um, team of people to manage a Japanese portfolio of direct holdings um, alongside um, one, one collective fund for Japan, which we're still holding around run, run, by eSpring. But that is something that we've done in the, in the course of the last nine months. We've actually moved to use our internal colleagues to pick some stocks directly in, in that market. We might, uh, if you have any questions about that, we can pick those up later. Um, North American weighting has gone down a little bit at the moment. We, we do feel that valuations in North America have, have, um, are, are higher than elsewhere. I mean, they always are. And growth, you know, to be fair, the, the potential, the, the, the long-term track record in North America has been very strong in small caps. So it's not a market we want to ever get too underweight to. But at the moment, we do feel that valuations elsewhere maybe on, on an aggregate basis look a bit more attractive. Um, the, the, the positions against the benchmark there, you can see at the bottom, I won't, I won't really dwell on. Um, on the right, it's just worth highlighting that, you know, that what I said earlier, that this is a diversified portfolio. So you can see we're, sp we're spread across the uh, all segments of the market. You can see we've got a big weighting in industrials. That is a that is quite a, a spread of different sectors within it, actually. But we have put more money into that area of the markets over the, over the last nine months because valuations in, in this field we think are attractive. Some companies are being impacted by um, things like destocking and, and um, issues in China, for example. But... Valuations are attractive in, in that in that in, in a number of cases in a number of cases there, and the collectives weighting you can see there that is really these fund holdings that we're we're holding on trust to give us exposure to emerging markets, Asian markets, and now um, part of our Japanese exposure is that within that eighteen percent. But um, you know I'm not going to dwell on that. But ultimately within within the within the nine months we have added to our exposure in real estate, um, which. We think maybe is a bit, is a beneficiary, hopefully, of the a lower interest rate trend that we're seeing. We've added a bit to industrials, as I said, um, and a little bit more into financials as well. And more recently, also finding some ideas in consumer discretionary, um, um, uh, where ultimately there's been some pressure on um, individual company valuations, which has uh, created more op op opportunity for us. We think uh, against this backdrop of hopefully a global um, fall in interest rates. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, we're going to just talk about some of the individual companies. Um, we're not going to go through all of these, uh, don't, don't worry, but uh, Nish, do you want to pick up a couple of the um, things we've been doing first? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have been active in a, in, in a whole host of different sectors, um, and we try to pull out some, some common themes um, that, that highlight what we've been doing in terms of purchases over the last 12 months. And one area where we have been very active is in quality businesses that we think can grow reliably. Now, why, why can they grow reliably? Well, first of all, um, these companies might be exposed to, to some secular trends, for example, um, or they may have a high proportion of their revenues that are recurring in nature, or their end markets just might be very stable. Um, so an example might be Domino's, for example. Uh, that's the pizza chain in the UK, which, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, they've got an incredibly strong brand. They have very strong scale advantages, particularly in areas like marketing. And that allows Domino's to take market share consistently from these smaller competitors on the high street. Um, and they've got a history of growing even in difficult times. They actually grew in even in the financial crisis. So, it's a very stable business that can grow extremely reliably. GXO Logistics is an American-based contract logistics provider. There is an outsourcing trend in the US and in, in other regions as well, 
where companies want to outsource their contract logistics provisions to specialists such as GXO, who can do the job cheaper and offer um, technology as well that, that they wouldn't be able to provide themselves. And we were able to buy into this business at a really attractive valuation because higher interest rates led to a derating um, in, in the company's valuation. Um, Peter, perhaps you want to talk a bit about Foresight and yeah. uh, I know you cover. Yeah, For Foresight is an asset management business um, relatively recently listed. Uh, it's really exposed to alternatives um, such as particularly infrastructure, uh, renewables investment, if you think like that. Um, and, and also private equity in the UK, regional private equity. Um, we've met the management on a number of occasions. We've been pretty, pretty impressed with the store. It, it's grown pretty strongly over a long period of time. We think it's got a really good runway ahead of it. Um, they've acquired a business in Australia, which gives them access to that market. And although at the moment there's, it's a bit of a more difficult environment for raising funds in infrastructure and, and alternatives as a whole, with the interest rates having gone up, we do think over the medium term, this is very strong growth potential. And, and over and above that, um, it's it's a majority owned by a, a founder who could conceivably could look to sell the business on to a, a, another mass, asset management company. We've seen other companies like Gresham House very recently taken over on a much higher multiple than than Foresight trades on. I think um, maybe we'll move down the bottom of the page, just talk about a couple of the cyclicals that we've added. So, you know, cyclicals by their nature do come in and out of favour and, and stocks can get too depressed, we think. Um, they might be cyclical, we think, if they are really good businesses, then we don't. We certainly don't want to ignore them. So a couple I'd mention would be Workspace in the UK. This is a um, provider of business space, not, not offices, really, for um, to, to the SME um, business community in London and the southeast of the, of the UK. A very strong um, you know, long-term track record of, of this platform um, that they've got. Um, more than 4,000 tenants, to Nish's earlier point, not exposed to a single, you know, major single tenants moving out of an office. Um, we think at the moment um, that valuations in the real estate sector have come under pressure as we've seen interest rates rise up and that's led to the shares heading down to a big discount to the 10 AB. And um, we think going forward that uh, rental growth is actually currently being pretty strong for the company. They, they manage their asset base very well. And we think that dynamic universe of companies they supply as tenant, they serve as tenants, the SMEs in London, you know, that's a much more attractive um, tenant base to go after, you know, by nature, the number of them, uh, as compared to if you're trying to let one single office, um, trying to find one single user for that uh, that space. And then Lancashire, um, very different, but that's within the insurance sector, reinsurance. We are, you know, quite optimistic about the returns that this company is going to deliver in the, in the, in the shorter term. They produced a very good uh, update last, back end of last year, where they, they announced a special dividend, ultimately conditions in the insurance and reinsurance market have moved in their favour because it, Insurance rates have shot up in the light of recent years' um, in, in, in losses um, in, in the, across the sector, and capital has retreated from the sector. So that's that's created a very strong pricing environment for Lancashire. We're expecting them to um, continue to uh, deliver good shareholder returns in the period forward and, and, and hopefully get re-rated. And then, Nish, do you want to say something about the commodity side? Um, yeah, before I move on to commodities, perhaps it might be worth touching on, on body coat. Um, because this is this is an example of an industrial um, that we've bought in the in the last year or so. Um, so Bodycoat is a provider of heat treatment services to industrial customers. So, for example, Rolls Royce will send their um, engine blades for their um, aircraft engines to Bodycoat um, to have them treated, so that it improves their strength and their ability to withstand a very harsh environment up in the air. Um, where, where you know, the, the, the movement of the blades can really create a lot of um, damage um, and, and wear and tear. Um, and body coat are specialists in this provision of, 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 of this heat treatment service, and they run their plants at very high utilization rates. And as a result of that, they are the lowest cost producer of this service. Um, and customers like that, um, they like to be able to, to provide, uh, to use a, a supplier that can be a specialist and do a better job at a, at a cheaper price. Um, the shares were out of favour when we bought into them because industrial production in many regions is extremely depressed and that's shown by the ISM levels. Um, but we think over the longer term the ISM will recover um, and the shares should re-rate as a result of that and earnings should grow as, as, as well. 
Uh, so that's a company that we're really excited about. And commodity related businesses is something where we have been active. Um, something that we noticed in talking to many companies and management teams uh, in the commodity space is that the sector has really had a long period of limited capital investment. Um, and therefore, um, the supply side looks really good in terms of it, it seems quite tight. At the same time, the demand environment is improving for commodities because of investment in areas like infrastructure and electrification. So one company that we were uh, quite excited to, to, to buy into was Vitesse Energy. Um, this is a uh, owner um, of, of interests in, in several wells in the Williston Basin in the US. So they're not actually exploring um, for oil themselves. They have partners that do that for them, but they collect royalties as their partners will explore and, and produce oil. So it's a lower risk way of, of, of um, gaining exposure to um, increasing activity in a shale in, in the US. Yeah, and obviously, uh, we have to when we when we buy things. Obviously, that has to be funded now. Um, you know, I, I think we have to always hold our hands up, and we always try and show um, things do sometimes go and grow in smaller companies. And there on the left hand side of the top here, you can see a number of stocks that we've um, we've probably got uh, got got wrong. Um, CNC and Sliga actually uh, just uh, won't dwell on them, but ultimately they're exposed to the hospitality market in UK and uh, UK, Ireland, and Europe. And both uh, CNC and Sliga had. Uh, their own issues, uh, operational issues, and, um, and and issues in terms of the market the structure of the market. So those those were stocks that we we sold out of on, as we lost confidence in the investment thesis. We did benefit from a number of takeovers in the in the last uh, 12 months. So uh, the restaurant group is the most recent one. That's the owner of Wagamama's in the UK. That, uh, some of you will be familiar with. That was taken over, um, and, you know, only a couple of months ago. Um, Focus Financial, there was a North American uh, wealth management consolidation vehicle, which was itself consolidated. Um, I, I won't dwell on, the, on all these names, but ultimately at, at the bottom you can see a number of stocks where we felt that valuations had, um, you know, had reached a high level. Uh, so Lotus Baker is an example there. They're a, a, a provider of Bisco, they own the Biscoff brand of uh, Biscuit, uh, which is doing really well, but the valuation of the stock um, ran very hard, and so we, we took uh, took profits in that, um, and a number of those other names. Energy in, in the UK market, the, the Israeli faith focused uh, oil and gas business. That that we also did put well in, and we we took profits in that. So I won't dwell on that. I think we probably want to just uh, quickly show you a couple of slides on the individual stocks. But I think in the interest of time, we're not going to dwell too long on these. But Nish, you want to say a quick word about these, please? Um, yes, so we, we have bought into uh, another industry we've bought into in the in, in the year is MSC Industrial Direct, which is a distributor of products that go into the metalworking industry, um, and they should continue to take market share from, from, from smaller competitors because of scale advantages. Um, workspace is, is one that Peter has mentioned, and Stabilis uh, in Europe, um, which is a motion control technology. Uh, provider. Um, that a lot of their products go into cars, uh, for example. Um, so so there, there would be motion technology to move the seats um, and and to 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 move the doors and, and so on and so forth. Um, more of their technology is going into cars. Um, so sort of content per vehicle is growing, um, and as a result of that, the shares have got a good growth outlook. Um, we wanted to talk a bit about valuations. So smaller companies in general um, have underperformed significantly relative to larger companies. And the valuations are really attractive. Um, if you look at them, the, the table at the top on the top, you can see in the American market, um, the smaller companies are trading on almost a 30% discount on some metrics relative to larger companies. Um, the bottom chart is interesting. This is the difference in the PE ratios between larger companies and smaller companies. And if you're below uh, the line there, smaller companies are cheap. And you can see that the relative uh, valuation to smaller companies is back towards the levels in 2000s. 
And after that period, there was a significant uh, um, time frame of, of outperformance of smaller companies that lasted almost six years. So we think that the opportunity is really um, uh, good at the moment in terms of valuations, and there could be a potential re-rating um, over a long period of time. And perhaps what might be the catalyst for that, because this is really well known. However, uh, many investors are questioning, well, what, what's going to cause that to, to mean revert? Well, we think one thing that, that's potentially on the horizon is the first interest rate cut. Now, the consensus seems to be that there may be the first interest rate cut from the Federal Reserve sometime in the late, late part of the first half of, of, of this year, sort of May, June timeframe. Um, all those, those probabilities are changing on a daily basis. Uh, but what happens after the first interest rate cut is that smaller companies tend to outperform. In the first 12 months after the first interest rate cut, history suggests that the outperformance could be anywhere, could be in excess of 10% relative to larger companies. So we are um, quite excited that, that there is a catalyst on the horizon for smaller companies to come back into favour. And then if we question why smaller companies have underperformed, I think part of the reason is that there's been a lot of fear about recession. And generally in the past, what's happened is that smaller companies have underperformed whenever there has been fear of recession. And then it, they have outperformed coming out of the recession. And interestingly, during the recession itself, smaller companies have actually been quite resilient. So if you look at the last um, six recessions in the US, for example, you can see the Russell 2000 um, during the recession itself, uh, the shares, the smaller companies fell by 4%, but the larger companies, as represented by the S&P 500, fell by more. They fell by almost 6%. But then coming out of the recession, smaller companies outperformed significantly, with the Russell 2000 outperforming the S&P 500 by almost 10 percentage points. Yeah, so if we sort of pull that together, then I think we do we do feel obviously we're biased because we, we're involved in the and the uh, running the fund, but we are and, and the asset class. But we do think this is an attractive asset class um, where active management does does add value over over time. And um, we think you need to take a long term approach to it, uh, a team based approach to it, and really focus on valuations and quality. Um, got a good, well resourced team. Um, uh, as I discussed earlier, obviously making further use of people within the enlarged Columbia Thread Needle Asset Management team. And, and that, you know, that I'm sure will continue on an issues tenure going forward. And, you know, the funds deliver good returns for investors over, over the long term. I think, I think on that, on that sort of note, I'll hand it back to, uh, to Christine or Alessandra. Thanks very much. Um, and yeah, hopefully if it was your first time hearing from Nish, uh, you can be assured that there's a safe pair of hands taking over um, from May. Um, and obviously thanks again to, to Peter for especially the, the strong performance, the leading trust in its sector over the last three years, both in NAV and share price terms. Um, and we have had lots of questions, so I'm really glad about that. But please keep submitting them and so we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, actually, in regards to Nation, if he's an unfamiliar face to some people, um, there's been one question about Nish, can you talk about your background and what your involvement has been with the Global Smaller Companies Trust till now? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've actually been involved with the Global Smaller Companies Trust since 2008. Um, and my first involvement with the trust was on the, on the US portfolio. Uh, which is the largest part of the trust at, at, at over 40%. And then with the UK portfolio um, and later on with the collectives. Um, I've been reporting to the board of the trust since, since 2013. Um, so I do have detailed knowledge of the investments that we hold within the trust. Um, and I've also been involved with the client uh, meetings over the last 18 months or so. Um, and uh, you know, managing the discount and the cash flows and, and all of the other um, nuances of, of, of an investment company. So I have a lot of experience with the investment side um, and the administrative side. 
So that gives you a sense that there will be an element of continuity. But at the same time, I can offer different perspectives um, that could potentially improve the proposition even more than it already is. Um, so there'll naturally be a, a period of transition. Um, Peter's here till the end of June. Um, so we will work together closely uh, to make sure that the transition uh, will be handled very smoothly. Thanks, Nish. I'll jump in again with a kind of similar question. What do you think will stay the same and what do you think will change after April when you uh, take over as lead? Um, so I, I think the things that, that will change will, that will stay the same. Well, the, the team is largely um, the same. So there is a lot of experience in this team. There's over a hundred years of investment experience. We've been through several market cycles. Um, we've been through pandemics, wars, elections, um, some stock market bubbles. So. There is a lot of investment experience um, here, and, and we're happy that, 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 that the team is, is largely intact. We will focus on long term investing, and I think that's really important in, an, in a market environment that is in, becoming increasingly short term, being long term, we think is a competitive advantage. Um, we've always run the trust in a conservative way uh, and focused on minimizing risk. And, for, and we do that by focusing on good quality businesses and paying attractive valuations for them. We think that that's an evergreen um, factor in investment success. So we would like to, for that to continue. Um, a dividend is important. The, 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 his, the history of the trust is that the dividend has grown for 53 years consecutively. And we want to continue that track record. We are very proactive in managing the discount as well. We think that's really important. So that's something that I think will continue. Um, what will change? So we were acquired, the BMO's um, asset management business was acquired by Columbia Threadneedle in, in 2021. Um, we co-located together in, in 2023. Um, and what we realized is that Columbia Threadneedle um, are very intense when it comes to research. Um, and they invest a lot of, of resources into research. And we wanted to, we, we realized that um, there were lots of people that, that, that we could um, talk to um, and we could gain, gain ideas from, um, and we're looking to harness this. So last year, after a long period of deliberation, um, we decided to um, insource um, or, or 50% of our holdings in Japan, which we were previously using collectives for, to our Japanese team at Columbia Threadneedle, who have a really good process that's very similar to the way that we manage money in, in other parts of the trust, um, and that have a track record in Japanese equities uh, in general. And we're pleased with how far that's going, and, and we'll, we will review that. Um, we'll investigate if there are other opportunities to do something sim similar. Uh, to make use of our wider resource base. Um, it isn't a secret that the trust pressure is extremely out of favour. Uh, the, the trust sector generally is, is, is out of favour, um, and small caps in particular. Um, so th we think it's a good time to look at the asset class because it, it is undervalued. It does well um, after the first interest rate cut, um, and it will do well as economic growth potentially picks up. So we want to go out and market um, the fund more um, to, to, to tell people about the potential opportunity. And we think that will be helpful in potentially closing the discount as well. Yeah, uh, at the last close, it was uh, close to 16% discount, so definitely good value there. Um, I'll read out a question, and it does pick up on one of your points in relation to the stuff that you were going through, the test. Um, I'm interested in future sustainability and wonder in particular how exposed you are to fossil fuel industry, including large banks and insurance companies that directly support them. Also, do you have a sustainability filter to ensure you invest in ethical companies? Um, yeah, good, good questions. Um, I mean, ultimately, this is not an ESG uh, badged fund, but we've always um, made a point in the annual report of communicating how we, how, we, how we think about ESG issues and sustainability. Uh, and you can see some case studies and stuff in, in, in that, that talks to that. Do we do have exposure in the fossil fuel market, uh, sector, as, as Nish has sort of uh, identified? It's a relatively small part of the trust, the, the whole energy um, 
investment um, side. To be honest with you, over my tenure as manager, you know, it's not tended to be a great place to make money in the small cap market. Ultimately, the big, the very big fossil fuel companies that we, we know, you all know of um, are the ones that make a lot of the money, and the smaller cap ones can be quite risky. So it is an area that we've we've tended to you know be uh, be skeptical of. Um, over the long term, but to Nish's comments, I think at the moment there are certainly some attractive opportunities in the space at the moment, which we don't want to ignore. Um, um, Christy, I the other point that um, you were making now, I'm just trying to yeah, like how you manage oh, the bank, the banks and the yeah, insurance. Exactly. So, so I mean, we we're not well, obviously we don't invest in the large cap banks. We do have exposure in we tend to have exposure to, to more niche banks, so in, in the UK context, companies that Nish follows really called uh, you know, One Savings Bank. Um, Paragon, those yeah. those sort of businesses that um, lend to um, particularly to the buy to let market in the UK, they're not really uh, lending all that much money. I don't think to the fossil fuel sector. But uh, do you want to say anything else on that, Nish? Um, so we do. This, as Peter mentioned, we're not ESG screened, um, but we do think that um, and assessing ESG risks and opportunities is an important part of assessing the business model in general because the culture of a business. Um, has to be so that most of the stakeholders are satisfied um, for the business to be successful over the long term. So we do pay attention to ESG risks and opportunities, but it is not an, an ESG um, screened funding uh, per se. Um, when it comes to banks and, and energy, um, most of our banks are, are actually specialist lenders that are more commercial banks um, that would for example, um, lend to, 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 to landlords that are looking to build property portfolios. Um, we don't have any specialist lenders that, that, that will um, have a high concentration to the energy industry. And if I can add, just as a, a firm as a whole, Columbia Threadneedle Investments rate our research intensity, as the guys mentioned, but also the responsible investment heritage that we've had, particularly coming from the BMO side, um, so it's the, that sense of that ESG integration into all the research of any stock that the portfolio managers are reviewing, um, that's very important and quite a, a unique selling point for us as a house. Um, then I'll move on to another question about management, and this kind of correlates to the G of the ESG potentially. Um, smaller company success or failure can in many cases be very focused on the management's execution, more so than that of large cap. How do you manage this risk element in the portfolio selection? Um, so we are very focused on management uh, quality, um, and we think that particularly in smaller companies, management is extremely important because many of these smaller companies, they might not have as developed infrastructure as the larger companies and, and layers of management. So um, the people at the top really dictate the culture of the business. Um, we will have regular contact with management teams. We will try and see them as often as possible. The team as a whole is very involved with company meetings. Um, as a team, we do something like in excess of 500 meetings a year with management teams across all, all the individuals. Um, we will ask questions about uh, the prospects for the business and any potential risks that we have identified. Um, we tend, one of our cell disciplines um, is if we lose confidence in a management team. So what would cause us to lose confidence in a management team? First of all, if there are continuous operational missteps, um, if there's really poor capital allocation, for example, um, acquisitions that don't make um, strategic sense or that are, represent poor shareholder value, um, if there is dishonesty, um, if there is uh, insider selling, for example. Um, so these are some of the triggers that we have um, if we want to um, sell uh, a position because we've lost faith in the management team. Is something that's really important. I'll just add that I think that, that uh, I think we've been really impressed with how a lot of the management teams of the companies we're involved with over the last few years have managed the, the COVID pandemic, uh, the, the war situation, rapid inflation, and we've been really impressed with how you know a lot of them have managed. And I think you know, I, I, from my point of view, I, I, when I, I meet companies, we meet companies of all sizes, and I think you know quite often it's the smaller company management teams that are the more entrepreneurial and the more dynamic and. Uh, you know, they're actually more impressive than the uh, maybe some of the 
the larger company management teams who are paid a lot more money. But, uh, Great, uh, that's really helpful. Um, now, separately, gross revenues fully recovered post COVID, up to and including H1. Are they continuing to grow healthily and at what sort of rate? Um, we don't have the specific data on, 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 on revenue growth rate for the whole portfolio as a whole. Um, but one observation I would make is that a lot of the revenue growth that we've seen over the last couple of years has actually been driven more by price than volume. Um, because we have been in a more inflationary environment. And as a, as a result of that, many companies have been passing through uh, these higher costs to their customers, um, and thereby they've been driving a lot of their revenues um, through, through price rather than volume. In, in many industries, we're yet to see the volume come back towards levels that, that were there in 2019. So there is still some recovery potential in, in many industries. Super. Um, then related to purchases and, and sales, what is the turnover of selling and buying investments last year um, as a percentage of total asset value of the trust, if that's possible, or else we can come back to you with um, exact details if you don't have a plan. Yeah, we, I don't think we have that precise data to hand, but I think in broad terms, I think it's, um, if, if you think about it as a percentage of the, the value of the fund, we tend to sort of on an annual basis be buying about 25%, selling 25%, so that added together, that's 50, if you like, and in terms of the NAV. So, um, you know, some of that activity will be driven by the fact that we're having to buy shares in at the moment. So share buybacks mean, obviously, we need to raise money from the portfolio. So you, you will, you know, sometimes uh, turnover data can be distorted, but we, we're looking to hold things, as we've said, really, for long periods. And you know, I think average holding period, three to four years, um, would be what we probably tend to look at, but we can we can come back with some um, precise data to, to the individual who asked that question. Yeah, we can do that. And then I'll combine two questions that are kind of similar um, in relation to the market cap range of the small cap company that you're looking at. Somebody's just asking what that is, but I'll tag on. Does the trust invest in prior IPO stocks like ICG Enterprise? So on the market cap, we look at it in market by market. So in the North American market, we'll we'll buy, we'll we'll go up to market cap companies of about ten billion dollars at uh, the point of the inception. That may seem like a very big company, but ultimately, in in, in a UK sense, it is. But in, in the North American market, that's actually not a very big company. So um, we've tended to find that um, companies uh, five to ten billion dollar market cap range tend to do pretty well in in in, uh, in the North American market if they've got a good model. In the UK, we're we're really looking at the the benchmark, the small company benchmark. We we measured against there, and broadly that means we we'll go up to about one and a half billion sterling market cap at the point of inception. Now, if we if we buy a stock and it does really well and it goes through that sort of cut off, then we don't immediately sell it. And if we think the prospects are still good, then we'll continue to run that position. I think most of our a lot of our long term holdings have, have been things that have grown, you know, over a long period of time that we just we've just held on to. Um, I think Brown and Brown's an example that Nish, uh, Nish, Nish was uh, familiar with in North America that bought uh, a number of years ago an insurance broking business. And I was talking to him the other day about is it getting a bit expensive now? And Nish just said, well, you know, just it's a compound it steadily grows and you know don't don't um, don't panic and sell out of it now. And so you know I think we need to be conscious that this is a small company's trust and we don't want people to be owning mega cap companies. We don't want to be holding a load of mega cap companies within it. But if we've got companies that are still on a good growth trajectory, then we, we, we want to run our winners. Um, Nish, do you want to add anything to that? I, I think that's true, Peter, that um, what we've found or our observation has been that a small number of companies will drive the majority of the return of, of the market over the long term. Um, and if we're in a happy situation where we've found one of these long term businesses, long-term growers that ha that can generate high returns on capital and that has a large run, long runway um, of reinvestment opportunities. We want to hold on to these businesses provided the valuations don't become egregious. And pre-IPO stocks? We, we don't do pre-IPOs. I mean, this, um, this fund, we, we have held in, but we have investment. Well, actually, we have, a, we have an investment actually in, in a company called Mercia Asset Management, which is on the UK portfolio. And they, they are a specialist uh, investor in venture capital, private equity in the UK regions. Um, 
And, you know, a little bit like Foresight, I mentioned earlier, I mean, Foresight are involved, Foresight are involved in, in private equity investing. Um, so we get exposure to that through our investments with them, but we're not going to go out and try and do that ourselves because it, it's another skill set. Um, you, need a, you need a dedicated team, um, you know, crawling all over early stage companies, really, if you're going to do it successfully. And that's really not our, not our skill set. But we're happy to invest in the space indirectly through really good, managed, well-managed businesses. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so yeah, we're coming up to a quarter to the hour, so we'll wrap up and um, I'll hand over to Peter just to make some closing remarks if you want to kind of bid your farewell or if you want to just um, wish Nish good luck as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, well, thanks firstly for everyone for dialing in. Obviously, we're, we're, we're very keen um, to keep communicating with you about what we're doing and Nish, I'm sure, will take that forward going forward and, 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 and make it better because he's... He's a younger person who's much more used to this uh, media stuff than I am. Um, but um, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure um, being the lead manager of the fund, and I remain that for the moment, on a joint basis. It's been a pleasure working with all the people here, and um, you know, obviously, I've, uh, I've really enjoyed um, my involvement with the, with the trust. Um, I remain a big, I remain an investor in the fund uh, myself, um, and look forward to you know seeing it thrive in the future. But you know, I think just to really just to Wish, wish Nish, as uh, Christine said, all the best in, in in the future with it. But I think you know the, the great thing is it's an attractive asset class, and you know we do think that there's opportunity in uh, investing in smaller companies that you you don't get in some of these very boring uh, large companies uh, that uh, that are on the market. We do think it's, it's fundamentally an attractive investment universe to pick stocks from. So you know I think hopefully it can uh, can continue to do well. But obviously we can't make any predictions about what's going to happen in the future. Um, but um, Anyway, you know, thank you again for your attention, everyone. And, uh, um, you know, I think I've still, we've still got some other functions we'll be doing in the, in the next couple of months. But uh, so I may, may, uh, may uh, see some of you or hear, uh, speak to some of you again before I, before I leave. But uh, anyway, that's all I would say, I think, Christine. Perfect. Peter, Nish, Christine, thank you very much for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of the Global Smaller Companies Trust PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good morning to you all.